Okay, so with there being so many different types of welding machines out there in industry, uh, more that you can find at the store that you can purchase for home use or use in your shop, whatever it may be, there's a lot that could intimidate uh, entry-level welders when it comes to differentiating the, the types of welders that are out there. And really, it boils down to there being three different types of welding machines. So, they are engine-driven. There's the conventional transformer rectifier welding machines. And then there are the inverter welding machines. So, we're going to take a quick look at all three. And I'm going to explain them uh, in a, a small amount of detail. Just enough to where you can get the idea of how they're similar how they're different, and then we'll move on to the next topic. So let's start with engine-driven welding machines. Just to make this really easy, it's a welding machine that often has an engine inside of itself that when that engine is running, it's supplying power to the welding machine that we then in turn use to weld. Now, a lot of these engine-driven welding machines also have outlets for us to plug stuff into, things like angle grinders, uh, stuff like that. Now, these are, they're pretty portable in terms of other machines that are, you know, really big and bulky and are limited to uh, being plugged into like something like a 220 outlet. So these... Uh, as long as you have a method of transporting them, you can take them anywhere. So think of people who are, you know, welding in very remote areas, whether it's a farm, whether it's um, out on a pipeline, or whether you're, you know, just in the middle of nowhere and you don't really have access to electricity. You know, you can't just plug something in whenever you want. If you have some work that needs to be done, engine driven welding machines will pretty much be the way to go. Now they do come in different sizes, so not every engine driven welding machine is gonna be the same or perform the same. Some have bigger engines than others, so the maximum amount of power that they can put out is going to vary with its size. And they come in both gasoline and diesel. So it just depends on which engine you want, which one you might be more familiar with as far as you know maintenance goes, because not only are you going to have to keep up on maintenance of the welding machine, but you're also going to need to keep up on maintenance on the engine itself. So typical things like oil changes, uh, spark plugs or glow plugs, wiring, stuff like that. So where these are great in terms of being able to take them anywhere you do have double the maintenance that you need to keep up with. And so as long as you have fuel to put into these welding machines, or sorry, as long as you have fuel to put into these engines, then you can keep using them uh, as, as much as you want. And so here's just a real quick picture of how some people choose to use these engine driven machines. So a lot of people will just oftentimes put them on the back of a flatbed pickup truck um, you can kind of think of, you know, small time contractors who might own their own business, you know, they offer mobile welding services, or again, you know, something where people are working on pipelines, and instead of trying to bring the pipeline to their shop, they can go right to where the work is, and just jump right out of the truck, gra grab their tools, fire the engine up and start welding. Um, I will say also uh, that having one of these, or actually two of these, really saved my butt when I was uh, back in the Army and, and I was deployed. Um, I, I was a welder, and, you know, places like Iraq and Afghanistan, it's kind of hard to trust the electrical grid. So oftentimes we had our own engine-driven welding machines and we'd put it up on a trailer and we'd take it, you know, from base to base, wherever the work needed to be done. And having one of these really came in handy when it came to making repairs, modifications, and, you know, things like fab fabricating things that um, other units may have needed. 
And here's actually a picture of what one of the Army's uh, welding trailers kind of looks like. So their, um, their welding machine is a little bit different than the one I had. I had the Trailblazer 302 diesel. This one looks, it's a little hard to read. It looks like a Miller Pipe Pro, if that's even really what it says. But this is this is the trailer that it comes on. This is just a close-up view. And then the engine-driven machine is just right in the middle. And all your equipment is typically housed on the sides of the trailer. All right, so let's talk about conventional transformer rectifier machines. So these are typically the big bulky uh, welding machines that you'll see in just about any shop, whether it's in a shop um, where you may have learned in high school, uh, maybe your grandparents had one of these if you come from a family of welders. Typical welding shops will have these. Uh, now these are not engine driven, so these are plugged into an outlet and they're typically plugged into, you know, we kind of just generalize it and say a 220 outlet, the same type of outlet that you would plug your dryer in at home. But realistically, they range anywhere from 208 to 230 volts, sometimes a little bit more, but we're going to stick with this range uh, for this course. Now, these welding machines can do a variety of different processes. You can do shielded metal arc welding, gas tungsten arc welding. Some of them will do um, gas, metal arc uh, sorry, gas metal arc welding and flux core arc welding if you have a certain attachment to hook up to these machines. So these are very versatile. You can do a lot of different processes with them. They output a lot of power, so you can weld on just about any thickness of metal. The problem or the drawback is they're not very portable. So they're, they're big, they're awkwardly sized, they are very heavy. So while even if you have a method of transporting them, you're limited to where you can actually use them because you need to plug them in in order to draw power. And so here is just a picture of one such machine. And so down here we have our conventional transformer welder. And then up here, uh, this is a cooler. So this is a cooling unit. So oftentimes when you're using a welding machine a lot for long periods of time, and you're using it to weld at very high um, amperage levels, the machine is going to heat up. And so if the machine does not have a built-in cooling system, then you'll have to go out and buy an auxiliary cooling system, hook it up to the welding machine, run it, that way it cools off and you can keep welding without any worry of damaging the machine or having to stop what you're doing and let it cool down. And then there are the inverter machines. So the, huge, the, the big difference that you should notice right away between the inverter welding machines and the other two types is that the inverter machines are often really small. Um, the average person can probably pick one of these up with one hand. You know, the, the average person, some of you might need to use two hands. I don't know. Maybe a second person. But generally, you should be able to just pick one of these up at will, move it around the shop if you need to. So they are very portable, but again, they are limited to where you can use them because they do need to plug in to an outlet to draw power. And I don't know if a majority of, e of these only run on, uh, you know, typical 110, 120 outlets because there are some that are capable of plugging into 220 outlets as well. So I'm, I'm not really sure of a number. We'll just say you know, random number 50-50. So let's just say half of them can only be plugged into the conventional like 110 outlets that you find everywhere in your house. And then the other half of these uh, can plug into both 110 and 220. The ones that can only plug into 110, they don't put out as much power 
as the conventional welding machines or the engine driven welding machines, but they do put out enough depending on what you're trying to do. If you're just doing little small repairs at home, say like on a car or motorcycle, maybe you're doing some ornamental work, you know, some hobby stuff, This these will work fine. If you have uh, the ones that work with 220, then often those can put out as much power the, uh, as the conventional welding machines. But there's a drawback to that, and I'll get to that um, in, in a short while when we talk about duty cycles in a later part of this module. And so here is just another type of inverter welding machine that you can use just to kind of show you that they are pretty versatile in the processes that you can use with them. And they are made by different brands. So, you know, there's quite the selection that you'll find out there. So what do they all have in common? One, you can use them to weld, obviously. But when we talk in terms of the very first welding process we're going to be working with, they all utilize constant current, or CC. So instead of saying they're a constant current welding machine, we can make it easier and just say that they are a constant current power source. So if we think back to one of the earlier lessons where we talk about how where the electricity comes from, that is considered a power source. But ultimately, when we're dealing with welding operations, the welding machine then becomes the power source. And we kind of forget about where the power is coming from after that. Or I should say before that. Is it engine driven or is it plugged into the wall? It doesn't matter. We call the welding machine the power source. So they are constant current power sources. So another way to remember constant current, or at least current in itself, is when we're using processes like shielded metal arc welding or gas tungsten arc welding, the one setting that we're changing on the machine is going to be amperage. Another way to say amperage is current. So if you can remember um, amperage meaning current and the only thing we're changing with shielded metal arc welding or gas tungsten arc welding being amperage, then you should kind of draw the line and say, well, this is going to be a constant current power source. And if, they, if you're still kind of drawn a little bit of a blank, let me uh, explain this. So... With electricity in general, there's amperage, and there's voltage, there's resistance, there's wattage, there's, you know, all different types of terms. But for welding, let's just focus on amperage, which can also be called current, and voltage. So think of amperage or current as being uh, the, the power that's being generated in the electrical arc. So whatever number you set on the front of your uh, welding machine, that's how many amps are going to be supplied into the electric arc while we're welding. And in voltage, you can call this uh, the pressure of electricity. This is the driving force that essentially pushes electricity uh, through the cables and into the electric arc. So again, when we're dealing with processes or machines where we're mainly using constant current, also amperage, the only setting we're going to be changing is amperage. The machine is going to uh, vary the voltage on its own. You can kind of think of the machine as being a little small uh, supercomputer. So as we're welding, it's going to raise and lower the voltage as needed. And then we have this little chart, which uh, you should have seen in one of the earlier videos. And I know it probably doesn't make a whole lot of sense at first, but let me go ahead and just break it down the best that I can. 
So welding machines utilize both voltage and amperage. Now there's two different lines here. So the first one we should already be kind of familiar with. I talked about how shielded metal arc welding and gas tungsten arc welding utilize constant current. Now that pretty much means that the other two, gas metal arc welding and flux core arc welding, utilize constant voltage. But I'll get into constant voltage uh, later on. For now, let's just focus on constant current. So remember how I said that constant voltage, or sorry, voltage is the electrical pressure. Well, in order to establish the, the electric arc, we need uh, sort of a jump start. We need a big delivery of voltage in order to start the electric arc and then man maintain it for a fraction of a second until the arc can um, establish itself and then stabilize. So in the very beginning, when we first strike our arc, we're going to need a whole lot of voltage. Okay, so the scale start uh, ends right here, and this is where our drop curve begins. So in this image, we've set our machine to approximately 114 amps. And in order to maintain 114 amps in our electrical arc, we need to first have a delivery of what looks like 32.5 volts. So over time, as our arc is established and then stabilizes, we no longer need that many volts to stabilize the electric arc. We just need it to start it and then stabilize it. And then once we start welding, the level of volts that we're using kind of drops down and we are mainly using current, okay, or amperage. So I hope that kind of clears up this confusing looking graph. So just one more time, when we're using constant current welding processes, we only need a big punch of voltage to get started. Once that arc has had time to stabilize and we start using or working towards using all 114 amps that we've set our machine to, the amount of volts traveling into the welding arc is going to decrease. Now, it's never going to hit zero. It'll never hit zero. You'll always be using some amount of voltage, just enough to keep the arc stable. All right. So pretty much constant current is used with manual welding processes. And I had just explained that with shielded metal arc welding and gas tungsten arc welding, uh, better performing with constant current. And so what a manual welding process means is that you are manually feeding material into the weld pool. So before I even start talking about gas tungsten arc welding, let's just focus on shielded metal arc welding. The welding electrode that we use to establish the arc and weld materials together ends up being consumed. And what I mean by that is the welding electrode, as you're as you uh, create the electric arc and use that electric arc to heat up and melt the, me the metals and infuse them together, the welding electrode is also becoming part of the weld. You're filling in that little space between the two metals and you're using that filler material to help those metals become one. And so over time, you're going to use up that electrode and you're going to be uh, adding it in by hand. You're feeding it in by hand. So that's why we say it's a manual welding process. So essentially, you're controlling everything to include how fast you're going from start to finish. You're uh, controlling the angle at which you're feeding the electrode into the weld pool. You're controlling how fast you're pushing the electrode into the weld pool. And you're also controlling that little gap, that space between the tip of your welding electrode and the weld metal. 
So remember I said the machine is going to control the voltage for you. Everything else we're in control of. And that's pretty much it. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out and I'll do everything that I can to clear things up and answer your questions. But for the most part, uh, this is the basic information that you need to know.